Welcome to our very condensed version of the history of plumbing. There is a lot of information out there, but we have chosen to touch on a few key points. So get comfy and let us take you first to ancient Egypt. Here I am in ancient Egypt, where I've just made it back all the way from the river, carrying these huge pots of water, which we all need to drink. Alas, as a slave, my work is never done, which is why I'm here outside the Chamber of Convenience. This is where the rich and powerful come to produce all their waste, ever so delicately, into lovely clay pots like this one. Uh-oh, this one's been used. Of course, it doesn't matter how rich or powerful you are, it all smells the same. The worst part is, I have to do the cats too. Next are the conquerors of plumbing, the Romans. Greetings, I am Gluteus Maximus. Here in the reign of Claudius, our great plumbers have developed the systems like aqueducts that move masses of water from the rivers and streams to supply our bathhouses and our crops. They've also managed to develop the systems to take our waste away. This allows our cities to become great and large and keep our citizens healthy. It amazes me in these times where we invade, um, settle peacefully with our neighbors that none of them seem to know how to move water other than to carry it in jugs over great distances. No wonder their armies are weak. Now did you know that plumbing comes from the Latin name for lead, lumbum? But don't let me hear you say anything about lead causing madness. It was only the other day that my grapes and I had a wonderful discussion of who was going to be the best combatant this year at the gladiatorial games. And that's where I'm off to now. Well, it sounds like plumbing is on the right track. For when the Roman Empire fell, most of the pipe systems and hot pools were lost into obscurity. 1300 years had passed before new plumbing innovations would appear again. Good day. I am Brother John, and here in the year of our Lord 1340, we monks have plumbing well covered. When we look to build a new monastery, we site them very close to rivers, far away from other villages. We use the water supplied by these rivers to divert it into and serve the monastery and then divert it back out to the river to carry on the cycle. Praise be. The water we serve goes first into our kitchens to allow our brothers to get a fresh supply of water for drinking and cooking. We then divert our water which we can use for irrigation and then finally, through the past the dormitories and through the rare daughter. The rare daughter, of course, is the Latin for the room at the rear. In this most humble of rooms, we monks, my brothers and I, have some of our most enlightening moments. They then passed swiftly and cleanly into the flowing water below, where they get taken by the diversion back to the river. Well, it seems that the further upstream you were, the cleaner your water was. For many years, people knew that water was dangerous to drink, which is why wine or ale were the choice of many generations. Here, in 1440, those peasants out there do their business in their hovels, with their pigs and their goats, or sometimes in the woods. That's where I ride with my horses. Ooh. At Castle Smythson, we have the most modern amenities. We have a garderobe with its lovely wooden seat. Oh, all our waste goes directly outside into the moat, where over time it will fill up and keep away unwanted visitors. Like my in-laws. Of course, my wife wants me to hire a gong firmer when it gets full. Those poor peasants, they're the ones that have to rake it out when it gets full and smelly. 
The merchants, however, they're sort of in between. They're not quite as, uh, you know, luxurious as we are. They just go into pots and they throw them out the window, shouting, Godilo! Just to give those passers by a bit of warning, you know, of what's coming their way. Ooh, that's pretty gross. Of course, when I was out in my carriage the other day, I heard someone shouting, Loo! But that will never catch on. Well, from moats to the first flush toilet, let us see what the Elizabethans are up to. Greetings, I am Sir John Harrington, godson to Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth and chief designer of Her Royal Privy. In my role, I have designed a revolutionary toilet for Her Majesty's use, the Ajax. It is the first flushable toilet that anybody has ever seen. But after unveiling it, she seemed to be most offended and banished me from court. You can imagine this is a very uh, trying time for me. But after many years, I was allowed back into court and my toilet was used. But it did not seem to be as popular as I had hoped for. The master, Leonardo da Vinci, also had designs for his own water closet. But unfortunately, expired prior to their fruition. You never know, in time, maybe my name, Sir John Harrington, will be associated with toilets everywhere. The Harrington. Or perhaps even better, the John. Anyway, I bid you good day. About 200 years have passed and we are about to discover the next stage in the evolution of the toilet. Good day and welcome to 1775. I am Alexander Cummings. And despite our troubles at this time across the Atlantic, I am fighting our own revolution. The revolution of the privy. It is from my design of the U-Ben that has allowed me to patent the very first water closet design. This design uh, helps minimize the smells associated with the use of the water closet and as such will revolutionize the whole world. Of course venting still seems to be a little bit of an issue and I have heard stories of explosions. So my uh, intellectual advice would be that if you're to use the privy at night, don't use your candle. Otherwise you might find the experience more enlightening than you would like. A few years later, Cummings designs were improved upon and the toilet moved forward in its evolutionary process. And that's uh, actually in the way of Queen Victoria. We have suffered an epidemic. Cholera, brought to us from Asia between 1832 and 1849, 14,000 Londoners perished. Many ideas have been put forward as to how the disease has spread. Over time, Dr. John Snow was the one who discovered the link between tainted water and the disease. It turned out that twibbies and cesspits were built far too close to wells. These last 50 years have seen an increase in the use of indoor privies. <clears throat> Very popular with the wealthy classes. Now, the problem with all these indoor privies is that the existing system didn't cope anymore. Well, 
Man, it's only designed to look after rainwater anyway. As such, all that waste went straight to our river Thames. Boah! Stench. Oh, the wildlife disappeared too. In 1858, London suffered a very discomforting time. So bad was the stink, Parliament had to close its doors and wait for the stench to abate. Ah, it was this event that kick-started the construction of our lovely modern sewer system, designed and built by Joseph Bazalgette. Ah, ah wonderful the sewers. It was only six short years after their construction that I saw, as a younger man, salmon swimming in the River Thames. Yes, 1864 it was. As we move through the century, plumbers have really come into their own. Of course, they're exposed to more hazards and dangers now than they ever have been. Gas explosions tend to be quite a big one. As such, part of their toolkit is a bottle of peppermint oil. Most ingenious it is. They use it for detecting leaks. The plumber who was here the other day says they stick a few drops in at the top of the house. And as they're walking through the rest of it, they can sniff out where any leaks are. Wonderful. Well, here we are in 1884, and I've just heard that this lovely gentleman engineer <clears throat> by the name of Thomas Quacker has just developed a revolutionary new toilet design. <clears throat> it has a bull chain, <clears throat> which happens to release water to refill the bowl once you're done. The heart's great. Thomas Crapper. I'm sure his name will go down in history. Once toilets and clean water supply had finally been made safe, there was no stopping plumbing from moving on up. Literally. Welcome to 1943. Going back a few years to 1903, the first plane was actually flown. Now back then, no one gave any thought about uh, pilots need to go. Flights were pretty short, and everybody was so excited about the thought of being up in the air, yeah, it wasn't thought about. Jumping forward 40 years, we now have airplanes that are acting like buses for people. You know, for short flights they'll pick them up and drop them off, it's great. When you start looking at transatlantic flights however, these ones are the long ones, 15 hours it takes to get from coast to coast. Now of course, Toilets on these flights are a must. Unfortunately, the same just can't be said for us pilots. We're still holding on. Back on the ground, however, toilet design really hasn't changed much over the last 50 years. We've got these lofty tanks that hold, uh, I don't know, about 20 liters of water, I guess. They got the old pull chain and you hear it flush and gurgle and all that wonderful stuff. Papers improved a little bit. We're now using newspaper or magazine pages. Of course, it, it, it's a little bit scratchy and the ink runs. I did hear it, however. There's a company that's looking into making a paper just for that purpose. Ooh, sounds great. I wonder if it's gonna be nice and cottony soft. Or better yet, quilted. Wouldn't that be fun? So of course, for us pilots, you know, with toilets moving indoors, it's better because now we can wait till the last minute before we go, hop on the plane, and we're taken care of. Anyway, time to fly. So, let's see what Dave has to say about plumbing in the here and now. Here we are in the 21st century. Plumbing has come a long way. With it, plumbing technology and the materials we used have vastly improved. 
Since its inception, we've used lead, iron, steel, copper, plastics for both water distribution and waste removal. With all these advances in technology, most people don't even realize how wonderful their plumbing is. Of course, we can walk into a house now, flush a toilet, the waste disappears off to the treatment center, the toilet will sit there, fill up on its own, and we don't have to worry about a thing. We also have hot water on demand, anytime we want it, it's there. Problems with plumbing now tend to deal mainly with water conservation. The world in which we live is a massive ball of water. And yet, only 3% of it is available to us for drinking. The population is continually growing, which gives rise to a greater need for us to reduce the amount of water we use. In homes, low flow and dual flush toilets are the norm. Taps and showers can run effectively while using very little water at all. Improvements in technology have led to discoveries of how important it is for us to continually test and treat the water that we do use. As plumbers, it is our job to ensure that any systems that tie in to the plumbing will not contaminate the fresh water we do have. Plumbers these days require many years of training to get their license. And like all other professionals, they require ongoing training throughout their careers to ensure that the public is kept safe from waterborne diseases and other sanitation problems. Maybe in the future, the best plumbers will get cloned to make sure the demand is met. We're nearly done. Just one more clip. Let's try and guess what we have to look forward to in the future. The year is 2150. The sustainability of our world's water supply is our top priority. The population has grown steadily over the last century. It has not helped that cloning has become fashionable over the last decade. Although, it is essential for us skilled professionals. Hi, two Houses have now been separated from all municipal water and sewer systems due to their inefficiency and their cost of upkeep. Thanks to plumbers and plumbing engineers, we are now able to better filter and recycle the water we use in our homes. Every house now has its own built-in water recycling center, so the drinking water, as well as all waste fluids, get cycled through several stages before reuse. Sorry, I've just been buzzed, so I will have to leave the rest of this with my number two. See you later, Dave. Well, it's great to know that water recycling has finally got to the point where what we flush away is also what we drink. Yummy. The solid matter, or poop, that cannot be filtered is converted into fuel, which is then used to heat the home and water. Well, on days when solar gain is just not enough. Hey two, don't forget to mention that we're using Plumavision now. But cats are still used to sniff out venting problems. Good point. <laughs>